Thank you, Michael. I want to uh, just say what a privilege it is to be able to give this unofficial wrap-up plenary. <laughs> and I want to start uh, by just asking everybody to give a round of applause to the organizers of this symposium, because it's been phenomenal. So, And next, I want to ask you to be a little bit sorry for me. Um, and that's because my job is to take the disparate strands of all this incredible information we've heard today and to weave it into a coherent picture that combines North Pacific right whales, Rice's whales, with input from North Atlantic right whales. So I'm going to do my best. Um, so stay with me. And I know it's been a long day, and it's dark in here and comfortable. So I invite you, uh, after this slide, to doze off if you'd like. Uh, but these are my five take-home messages that I would really like you to take away. One, I want us to celebrate the success of the ESA. I want to build on messages that uh, Janet Coit started with today. Secondly, I want to emphasize how important places like this are for conservation. We typically think of conservation scientists as working in the, in the field, but we rely on places like the Smithsonian so much for the work that we do, and I'll, I'll, I'll just build on that message that we've already heard from Michael. Thirdly, for the two species that we're focused on today, I think we can draw very important lessons from the hard work that our colleagues have done in the Atlantic on right whales, and I'll, I'll make that point. Just to emphasize what, we've just, what we were just talking about, we need resources um, specifically for these two species, uh, perhaps uh, even more so for North Pacific right whales, but we need res dedicated resources, dedicated funding for the conservation of both species. And then I'm just going to emphasize it is not too late, and that'll be the message I'll leave you with at the end. So uh, Janet started uh, our conversations today by saying uh, how effective the ESA ha had been. Uh, Laura really eloquently also made the point that uh, the ESA has been effective in preventing the extinction of any large whale uh, since the ESA was passed in 1973. And I want to just riff on a, on a message that Laura made, that these are long-lived animals, and 50 years seem like a long time to us. It's only a couple of generations for whales. So we shouldn't expect that all of the whales that were listed in 1973 or shortly thereafter should, should have recovered by now. It's going to take time. But those species with slightly faster life histories, like gray whales and humpbacks, we have seen conservation success. We've seen uh, distinct population segments delisted. And for other species, like blue whales, that were uh, greatly depleted by commercial whaling, some of those species now support lucrative whale watching industries in places like California. Bowhead whales, that are the subject of an Aboriginal subsistence hunt and are co-managed by NOAA and the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission, are recovering to the point where we can start to think about them as candidate species for, de for downlisting. So, we need to celebrate these successes. We're often, we often hear that the ESA is not doing enough to recover these species. We need to be mindful of the life history of these animals and point to the successes where they occur. It would have been unimaginable um, for Charles Melvin Scammon uh, that we would have 20 to 25,000 gray whales today. This is a quotation from his monograph that John uh, mentioned earlier today. And the idea that we would have recovered them to the point where people would watch them in places like Baja, California, and along the coasts of North America would have been just really unimaginable to him because he believed that they were doomed to extinction. So let's, let's celebrate those successes. And I'm going to tell you that Scammon's going to make several appearances through my talk, so wait for it. Um, I'm going to talk about the importance of museum collections for conservation, and I'm going to highlight the work of one of my brilliant PhD students, Dana Wright, who you've already been introduced to uh, by Jessica. But if you'll permit me, I want to make a little personal aside here. I first came to the Smithsonian uh, when I was a PhD student at the University of Guelph in Canada, and I was getting ready to go to Peru to study an unregulated harvest of small cetaceans there. And Jim Mead uh, kindly invited me to come to the, and my colleagues to come to the Smithsonian so we could look at the collection, so we could recognize the skulls of the animals that we would be studying. Um, and so we came, and Jim and Charlie and Bill uh, showed us the collection. And it was enormously useful to us, but it was not apparent then at that time that the most important part of that visit would have been uh, the personal and professional relationships that developed with Jim, Charlie, Bill, and later on Anne 
that have lasted through my, my entire career. And they're some of the most important uh, relationships uh, to, my, to my professional work. And so I think not only the collection's important, uh, but as you heard from the director today, the people here are important. John, Michael, the work that they do. Uh, and also the power, the convening power that places like this have. The fact that we are together here at this museum to talk about whales on the brink, I think is also very powerful. So let's talk about um, the specific case. You, you've, you've, we've just heard about North Pacific right whales. Dana Wright did her PhD in my lab, finished this uh, this spring. Now she's back working with John and, and Jessica and, and their colleagues. And Dana wanted to know where these animals might go in the wintertime. And, and you've just heard that we know very little about the, their distribution outside the summer feeding months. Uh, on the right here, you can see maps of, this is another depiction of some of the data that John showed, uh, the distribution of the harvest of whales in the spring and summer. Uh, those are the dark gray dots. The magenta dots are contemporary sightings, sightings, recent sightings of those animals in those seasons. And then the really gray dots are the positions of whaling vessels at noon each day. And you can see that we have a pretty good idea of where the whales were, the, both the eastern Pacific population and the western Pacific population in the spring and summer. But in the wintertime, we have virtually no information because the whalers left. They weren't dumb. They weren't going to stay in the Bering Sea in the winter. So what did they do? They went to Hawaii. They went to the South Pacific to hunt sperm whales. So we have no historical information on where those animals were. And as you've just heard, like imagine going out to do a survey in the entire North Pacific looking for 30 animals, right? It's crazy. So Dana decided that she would use baleen plates and look for um, biogeochemical signatures in those baleen plates that might tell us where the animals were outside the summer, summer feeding season. And I'm really happy that this was a project that was funded by the Marine Mammal Commission uh, that was conducted here at, at the Smithsonian. And there's a picture of Dana sampling one of the baleen plates here at the Smithsonian. And thanks to um, Kathleen uh, for talking about how we go about analyze, analyzing baleen, and also to Jeremy for talking about biogeochemical uh, tracers in stable isotopes. I'm not going to spend very much time on it. Here's a baleen plate, uh, one of the baleen plates that Dana sampled. And these are stable isotopes of nitrogen, and nitrogen 15. And you can see those very, very nice annual cycles. And those peaks, we think, are summertime feeding, and those valleys are, are periods of the wintertime. On the right is a, a collections tag from a baleen plate collected by Charles Scammon, which I think is an awesome thing. And Dana talked about what a powerful experience it was to open the drawer, see, these baleen, see this baleen plate that had been collected by Scammon himself. What Dana did was to create isos, isoscapes. So these are uh, the um, patterns of nitrogen and carbon stable isotopes in large biogeographical geogra provinces in the Pacific. And then to overlay individual positions along baleen plates on those isoscapes to see if we could make uh, some assessment of where animals might have been in, in summer and the winter months. And this is just one example. This is an animal harvested in Kodiak. This is an animal that was sampled in the same day as the skull that's here in the museum. And so here, oh, don't do that, Andy, Jesus. You're about halfway through my talk already. Here, um, so here are the uh, isoscapes. This is the Bering Sea up here. Uh, here's California there. Here's the, su the uh, sub Pacific uh, jars just south of the Bering Sea. And these dots are, this is summertime and this is wintertime. So we can get some insight into where these animals were, uh, were feeding both in the summer and the winter. The number of plates that were available to Dana is very small. Six plates, every plate in North America she sampled. Unfortunately, all those plates we know of were from males. So again, we don't have any plates for females, which the animals were more likely to, uh, to have migrated. What Dana found was that um, animals had different patterns, so not all the animals were doing the same thing. All those males were feeding both in summer and winter, suggesting that maybe the males don't migrate to southern, southern latitudes. And so it helps to, helps to um, paint the picture at least of what the males are doing with some hint that some of those males might have been feeding in coastal waters too. There are other plates in Japan that have not been analyzed yet and it's possible that some of those plates are from females and that some of those plates might hold some uh, clues to where those animals might go so that then we could do dedicated surveys in the wintertime or deploy acoustic monitoring systems in those areas where we think those animals might have been. So I think it's just a great example of the power uh, and I can't remember who said it today but Maybe it was Michael. Um, 
individuals collecting tissues and curating them so that people could ask questions that we can't even imagine. So the tissues that are being collected and the samples that are being collected and curated today, 100 years from now, people will have incredible systems, incredible techniques that we can't even imagine. But it's so critical to put those, to put those samples away and, and care for them. OK, so we've got these two species on the brink. We also have a third very critically endangered species for which an enormous amount of work has been done. Entire careers have been spent um, studying these animals, people like Michael, Scott Krauss, Amy Knowlton, Phil Hamilton. And so what can we learn from North Atlantic rivals that we might be able to apply for these, these other two species on the brink? So you've probably seen this infographic from NOAA. We've heard some of this today. Right whales were increasing in the North Atlantic until 2010. The population has been declining since then. We do see the start maybe of an amelioration of that decline. And the reason for that is that we're killing more right whales that are being born into the population. And the two primary sources of mortality are entanglement of fishing gear and collisions with large vessels. Happy to report that the first North Atlantic right whales are heading to the breeding grounds. We heard yesterday three right whales sighted off Oregon Inlet, North Carolina going south, another individual off Virginia Beach going south. We're hoping we'd have a bumper crop of right whale babies this year. This is the, an, another infographic from NOAA that describes how NOAA approaches the recovery of this species. And here's where I kind of go back and invoke Barb's really great um, analogy of like a patient coming to the emergency room. So to stop the bleeding for North Atlantic right whales, what do we need to do? We need to address entanglement and we need to address ship strikes. And if we can staunch that bleeding, then we can also look to some of the emerging threats, some of the other issues that the patient might have that we're gonna to have to deal with in the near term future. And here for us on the, on the Atlantic coast, it's the increasing urbanization of the habitat of the, of the whales that includes things like wind development, but also other, other emerging uh, patterns of industrialization. So we know really well, we know a lot about these two threats. Um, we know, uh, we know how uh, whales are and when, for the most part, they are struck and killed by, by vessels. And we know uh, the gear that the animals are entangled in, and, and we don't know exactly where that happens often, but we, we know a lot about that process. So we're fortunate that we have more information than we do for the other two species on the nature of these threats. And that allows us to build mitigation programs to deal with those two threats. On the left, we see the proposed rule to enhance uh, restrictions on uh, vessel traffic uh, throughout the habitat of North Atlantic right whales. This is the proposed rule that you heard about earlier on that will extend the geographical scope of the rule that we know is effective in reducing the likelihood of collisions uh, and also reduce the size of vessel, bring the, the size of vessels that the rule applies to down to, to smaller vessels. And on the, on the right hand side, we have the kind of the roadmap to on-demand fishing, ropeless fishing. Um, and we are working very hard, our folks at NOAA and their partners in industry are working very hard. And we're, we're somewhere now in this area here, working towards uh, resolving gear conflicts, expanding experimental fisheries. We have a fishery in the Mid-Atlantic, the Black Sea Bass, bass Pot Fishery, uh, that is on its way to going completely ropeless. There are a lot of issues, a lot of political issues for both of these. And I just encourage all of you to support these initiatives, to support NOAA's proposed rule. Public comment periods closed now, but when you talk to folks, support that rule. And also to support the development of ropeless technology and the implementation of ropeless technology in fisheries. So what do we need for rice as well in North Pacific right whales? This is my, my take on, on what we've heard today. Uh, in a slide that was prepared last week before I saw all the talks today, so keep your fingers crossed. I was kind of like... Clearly, for both species, we need more information on distribution. Do rice as wells extend into Mexican waters? It seems like they probably do, but it would be really nice to know that for sure. Where the heck are North Pacific right whales for most of the year? Where do they go? Who migrates? Where do they migrate to? A lot of us have standing bets on where there is. Is it Hawaii? Is it California? Maybe they don't go to coastal waters. Maybe that's why don't, we don't see them in coastal waters. Maybe they go give birth in the middle of the North Pacific. We need to identify the immediate threats to the recovery of both species. And then we need to develop management plans. We started talking about ship speed rules for North Pacific right whales uh, to mitigate those threats. 
And then we need to work to uh, understand emergent threats, the threats that are going to be a problem as we go into the next couple of decades. We have guidebooks to help us. Um, we have a recovery plan for North Pacific right whales. We heard about that um, from, from Jess, from I can't remember who, some, somebody in the last couple of uh, talks. And then we have a recovery outline for rice as well too. So we're, we're, we're working through that and we're building on what we know, uh, uh, the limited knowledge we have, the biology for both of those species, and inferences we can draw from right whales and others. So here's my take. Um, rice as wells, well, ship strikes clearly, right? Um, we know that uh, vessel traffic is intense in the Gulf of Mexico. It overlaps with what here you can see is proposed critical habitat. We know that, that animals are, are struck and killed. We know what to do to reduce that threat. If we can get vessels to slow down in areas where rice, rice as wells are present, uh, that, will, that will help deal with, with that threat. As we've heard uh, from several folks today, rice as wells live in an incredibly urbanized habitat especially um, because of energy development and exploration. We think that the Deepwater Horizon a disaster might have, a camp, might have been responsible for almost a quarter, a mortality of almost a quarter of the population. But as Melissa said, it's not just that. It's the noise that comes with air guns, with energy development. And is it a coincidence that the rice as well are found in the quietest part of the Gulf of Mexico, as Melissa said, or is that just because that's where we can hear them? So this is clearly a major threat to the, to the species. Emerging threats. I've picked on offshore aquaculture here, but as Lance said, NOAA is doing a really good job in trying to side offshore aquaculture away from rice as well habitat. But I use offshore aquaculture just because it's one example of what's going to happen to the Gulf of Mexico in the coming de decades, which is increasing urbanization. So it's going to be aquaculture, it's going to be floating offshore wind, it's going to be carbon sequestration and removal, things that are hard for us even to imagine. So there's going to be more stuff, more human uses of that already in increasingly, ur that it, more human uses of that urban environment uh, as we go forward. North Pacific right whales, we just heard about entanglement. I think entanglement, because of the way that right whales feed, because there are a lot of pots, because there are a lot of vertical lines in the water, it is hard for me to imagine that entanglement is not going to be a big issue for North Pacific right whales. I think that's going to be a sticky problem in Alaska. Um, we know that we, as you just heard, we know that we have records of entanglement in both the eastern population and the western population. Um, and so that's something that we're going to have to deal with. And we're going to have to deal with ship strikes. And the conversation we just heard, uh, I think, is, is instructive, right? It's going to be, Alaska is a complicated place. And it's going to be complicated, but I think, again, we know what the issue, we know it's an issue. We know what the solution is with, sh with ship strikes. It's slowing vessel traffic down. And uh, I know that's going to be controversial and difficult, but I, I think that's where we're going to end up going. <coughs> Emerging threats, future threats to right wells, I think for me in the Pacific, re revolve around climate change. This is a, a, an ecosystem that is changing in really profound ways, very, very quickly. And so um, we heard about the cold pool and the movement of the cold pool uh, north and the disappearance of the cold pool in some years. What is that going to mean for the foraging ecology of North Pacific right whales? And as the ice retreats and we move towards an ice-free Arctic, that means increased shipping. We're already seeing, as we heard in the Marine Mammal Commission meeting this week, we're already seeing vessel traffic even very late and early in the winter, in, 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 in per winter periods. And so that's going to be a risk to, uh, to right whales as well. It's not too late. It's not too late. It's not too late. And I'll give you the example that Barb uh, brought up earlier today, northern elephant seals. And here's where I have to have a little asterisk next to my museums are really important for conservation because every now and then collectors hundreds of years ago do terrible things like try and go and collect the last few elephant seals because they were none in the Smithsonian's collection. So we'll set that aside because <laughs> This is um, from Bernie LeBouf and, and Dick Law's wonderful book on, uh, on elephant seals, northern and southern elephant seals. And it just re refers to the fact that Scammon um, uh, made a trip to uh, Baja, California when he was on his way down to harvest gray whales, trying to harvest elephant seals as well because they had been a reliable source, an extra source of oil for them. And 
between 1865 and 1880, only a few elephant seals were found. Every elephant seal that was found was killed, and the species was considered extinct by 1870. Townsend, who you heard about earlier today from John, uh, went to Isla Guadalupe in 1892 uh, in, on a collecting expedition for the Smithsonian. And he wrote up in his report, after he had collected seven elephant seals, the action was considered justifiable at the time, as the species was considered doomed to extinction, and probably more importantly for Townsend, few if any specimens were to be found in the museums of North America. At that time, we think that maybe as few as 20 elephant seals remained in the North Pacific. The population was completely bottlenecked. There's virtually no genetic diversity. Every elephant seal that exists today on the Pacific coast of North America is a descendant of one of those 20 or 30 or 40 elephant seals. And where are we today? Today we have 20 breeding colonies that extend from Baja up to Vancouver Island, and probably more than 200,000 northern elephant seals. No genetic diversity, they're doing fine. And I think in a really profound way, so folks who study elephant seals believe that there are likely more elephant seals present today than at any time since humans first arrived in North America. Because when the first humans came to North America, they harvested elephant seals pretty hard because elephant seals were a good source of protein and oil. And so I think that's a great example of the kinds of recovery we can have from populations that were reduced to levels that are at least as small and perhaps smaller than Rice's whales or North Pacific right whales. So what do we need to do? First and really importantly, and John said this and other folks have said this too, um, we need to increase public knowledge and support for conservation efforts. And that means telling stories. That means telling stories like Michael Moore's wonderful book, We Are All Whalers. It means telling stories in documentaries like uh, The Last Right Whale, which is focused on North Atlantic right whales. And I know there are some of you in here, Molly, wherever you are, who are thinking about doing that for Bryce's whales. We need to tell those stories. We need folks in the Gulf of Mexico to believe that those whales out there are their whales. And we need folks in Alaska and British Columbia and California to know about North Pacific right whales, as John said, and to believe that they are their whales and they need to be protected and conserved. And another lesson I think we can learn from North Atlantic right whales here is that the history of individual animals matter. Janet Coit talked about the importance of her and her daughter seeing mosaic and her calf in Cape Cod Bay. I helped to disentangle Argo in February of this year. And it was a really profound thing to know that Argo, this animal that we were, it was desperately badly entangled, was an old male, kind of like me, with a 42-year sighting record. And then we knew where he'd been, and we knew where he'd been entangled. Snow cone, a female right whale whose first calf was struck and killed by a boat, who gave birth to her second calf while she was entangled, that calf died, and Snow Cone is now dead. Those are powerful stories. And I was listening to, to Lance and, and his colleagues talk about individual Rice's whales and the fact that we could identify that, that whale based on its dorsal fin that came up on the beach. That's a story that needs to be told so the people in the Gulf of Mexico identify with that individual whale and can then think about how important it is to conserve the whales that are left. Secondly, as, you, as we just talked about, we need dedicated funding for both of these species. I'm just so impressed with what, both, um, what NOAA has done in both regions with very little dedicated resources. Um, and so, Connor, we need to talk about how we do this. We need, and we are, we are committed to do this at the Commission, to work with Congress to make sure that there are funds appropriated to support the research and conservation efforts for both of those species. In the meantime, there are still some things that we can do. For the North Pacific right whale, there are those plates in Japan somebody needs to work on. There are a lot of acoustic recordings in some places that are potential overwintering habitat that have yet to be analyzed. <laughs> For the rice's whale, you heard Melissa talk about some really cool new ideas about acoustic localization of animals and using the passive acoustic recordings to estimate population size. So those are things that can be done with not a lot of, of new resources that will help improve our knowledge of both species. 
For both species, we need to build international collaborations. John made the point. North Pacific right whales are an issue for the United States, for Canada, for Mexico, also for Russia, also for Japan. Some of those geopolitics are complicated, but we need to work at it. For rice as well, the US and Mexico are likely going to have to work together if we find rice as well in the southern Gulf of Mexico, where it seems, based on Lance's habitat modeling, they are likely to recur. So we need to work, though it's going to be complicated, uh, but we need to work with our international partners. And lastly, to pick up a point that Laura made, we need to try to reduce the politicization and polarization around, around these conservation efforts. And I'll say two things to, to address that point. One of my colleagues at Duke, when we uh, tackle really difficult, wicked problems, likes to say, what is our superpower? What's the superpower that we can bring to, to, to this problem? And for us, the superpower is that the American public loves whales. The American public loved whales in 1972 so much that they demanded that Congress pass the Marine Mammal Protection Act. They don't love whales any less today. So let's harness that energy that the American people have um, to talk when we talk with our politicians. No politician in Washington wants to say, let's kill more whales. Let's let rice as well go extinct. Let's harness that, that, that public support. The second thing I think that we need to be cognizant of is that all of us in this room and online are here because we care about the conservation and the recovery of these two species. For some of us, the agencies don't move fast enough. But as you've heard, they have a lot of hurdles. It's difficult. It's not helpful for us not to work together. The forces who are opposing conservation efforts have political power, they have deep pockets, and we need to work together as a community of NGOs, government, academics, to push these conservation efforts together. As a conservation scientist, like Barb and like others here, I'm often asked, like, do you have hope? I love Matt's idea of muscular hope. I have muscular hope. And I have muscular hope for two reasons. One, I go to work every day and I work with brilliant young students like Dana, Brianna, a lot of the graduates of our program who are here. And they are dedicated, committed, passionate, and they are going to pick up the torch and they are going to make sure that we don't lose these species. That's one of the reasons I have hope. The second reason I have hope is because these animals, as we've heard, are resilient. We just wrapped up two days of annual meetings of the Marine Mammal Commission in which we discussed the effects of climate change on marine mammals. And we were reminded yesterday in the afternoon by a representative of Aboriginal subsistence harvesters in Alaska of the resilience of the animals that those communities rely on. And she talked about how she lives in a place where Exxon Valdez had catastrophic consequences for marine mammals, but how she and the people in her communities have seen those populations um, recover and be resilient. And when I think of resilience in that way, is I think about Barb's work and the work that some of us have done with, with the vaquita in the Gulf of California. And the fact that those little porpoises have held on in the face of like overwhelming odds. There should not be any vaquitas. But there are some badass, tough vaquita moms <laughs> in the upper Gulf of California who are, by God, not going to get tangled in nets. And, and they're still with us. And while they're still with us, there's a chance, just like there was a chance for, with elephant seals. So I'm going to close, and I want to close with a little thought experiment for you. I want you to imagine 50 years from now a symposium that celebrates the recovery of North Pacific right whales and rice's whales held in this very room. And I expect that some of you in this room and online who are in your 20s today will be recounting your rich, rewarding careers spent recovering the, those two species. And I think that's a really nice way to end this symposium. So thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Andy. That was such a wonderful talk, as always. And